The telecom sector is undergoing drastic change in almost every way. But where is the industry heading and what challenges do companies in the telecom sector face? Well, to get some informed views today, I'm talking with Asfar Aslam, Chief Technology Officer Europe at Nokia. Asfar, thanks very much for joining us today. Um, so uh, what are the key challenges and opportunities that you see across the telecom industry right now? Well, let's start with the um, opportunities first and the good news, that, which is around the recognition that our industry is extremely valuable and important for the rest of the society and the economy. Uh, coming out of COVID, I think nobody will disagree that the role that we played in keeping the world going uh, was uh, fairly significant. Uh, on top of that, what we're seeing is that then there are new opportunities ha that have been developing at a slightly slower pace, but they're picking up now, particularly around the digitalization of the industries. Now, that was a thesis before COVID that the physical industries require digitalization to be more productive and they will need help from our industry, uh, whether that is through the wide area network services, cloud services or on campus services. Uh, that has remained true. And what we're starting to see is a scale up of that starting finally starting to happen. Um, what we hadn't quite realized before COVID, but now we do, is that the enterprises and the digital industries also required some help. Um, and that's another upside opportunity for us where our infrastructure is going to enable the greater productivity uh, by using tools, as we will hear a little bit later on, with tools like Metaverse coming into the enterprise world and driving the productivity via better collaboration in those environments. So starting with the recognition already, Going into the upsides, I think there is, there's a great uh, amount of opportunity for us to continue to grow and expand and continue to deliver more uh, impact. When we look at the challenges, uh, what we first of all look at is the financial health of the industry. I think we've struggled over the uh, middle part of the last decade in particular, coming out of the financial crisis at the beginning of the uh, previous decade. Um, so we've gone through a transition where some of the cost-cutting measures, some very lean operations within the uh, CSP side of the industry, they have helped us improve the profitability of these businesses. Now, that's not going to be sufficient as we go through this particular decade because there are a number of disruptions happening, and we will talk a little bit about those uh, later on today. But when we look at some of those disruptions, uh, things like the economies of scale that we have enjoyed, over the last few decades. Well, they are at risk because of the geopolitics around the world right now. Um, more for the same or lower cost, which is also something that this industry has enjoyed for the last 30 years. Well, that's a little bit at risk as well because of some of the physical limitations that we're starting to see um, in various parts of the networking technologies. And then interesting innovations around the fundamentals of science and technology that have actually helped us get through those challenges so far. And we believe that some of those capabilities will help us through this decade as well. Uh, that happened in the area of spectrum crunch, in the wireless, in the wireline, in the optical networks, when we started to approach the Shannon limit, we found new ways of delivering more spectral efficiency, more capacity into these networks. So our belief is that for the business as usual uh, demand in this industry, we will be fine. So the final piece is the uh, if I look at the customers' challenges in particular related to their economic challenges, um, they needed to find growth and all the opportunities that I've listed earlier on, we believe are the ways that they will be able to grow their revenues and margins going forward to have a long-term sustainable business. So with all this in mind, all these changes in mind, how are the demand vectors evolving in the industry and how will the telecom sector cope with these changes? I think the first thing is that when we look at the business as usual demand, which is more data growing at roughly 40, 50% every year, that's something that we've lived with for a very long time and we, knew, we know how to deal with that. We have enough spectrum, enough technology to take care of that kind of growth. So we call that business as usual challenge. The other piece is like the new demand that is going to come from the industry 4.0, which is today only in the campuses. And these campuses are just starting to go digital, uh, bringing in new technologies, which is creating more data. But that's still in small number of campuses today. As we start to connect these campuses together and that data starts to find its way onto the wide area networks that our customers, the CSPs are running, that's where we start to see a, a, a step change 
uh, that we will need to figure out how we will architect the networks, what technologies will we use where, so that we can continue to deliver cost-optimized networking for those industrial customers. The next big sh uh, shift comes from the metaverse. Uh, no, for us, our thesis is that the industry and the enterprise, the value of the metaverse is actually rather clear. In the industrial segment, it's about digital twinning, making sure that you know all the processes can be optimized, the productivity can be improved there. In the enterprises, things like uh, the collaboration that we are using right now, the tools that we're using, can we make them more intelligent? Can we drive better collaboration between the employees, particularly when they're working remote? So Metaverse will have a role to play, and we're already seeing applications around that. The third piece, which is around the device, particularly for the consumer segment, will be a real difficult one to solve. But once that is solved uh, over the next few years, then we will see, again, a lot of traffic coming in from the Metaverse applications. So business as usual today, not a big issue. The next step change comes from the ind industrial customers when the big data starts to appear onto the van environment and then the proliferation of the metaverse applications. So those will be the real game changes in terms of the new demand vectors from the volumes and the latency requirements point of view. Then there's an other segment, which is the developer segment, which is effectively creating the applications, whether they're for the metaverse environment, whether they're for the industrial or enterprise uh, environment. When they need to build those applications. They need to consume our networks in a slightly different way. They need access to capabilities that they've not had before, but they need that to make the industrial applications work, the metaverse applications work, and then enterprise applications work. So to pull this together, they now need to be able to consume the networks in a new way that requires us to open these networks uh, so that they can access the APIs, build applications, and deliver the services to all those relevant segments. So. When we go from the business as usual growth in traffic and demand to these very stringent requirements from the other industries, it will start to create a requirement from our CSP customers in particular on how they build and evolve the networks, the kind of architectures that they will choose and the kind of solutions they will choose it with. So yes, there is a bit of a disruption coming uh, beyond the traditional data growth. Uh, and then the good news, of course, is that then we have some idea on how we will be able to take care of that. So with these kind of demands and, and stresses on the networks changing, uh, what will the networks of the future look like? Uh, what will their fundamental capabilities and attributes be like? Yeah, one of the things that we had to do right at the beginning, and this is almost two years ago, is go back to the drawing board and see where is the world going during this decade? So what will the world look like by 2030? Uh, and we called it our Vision 2030. In this Vision 2030, what we are also looking at is a number of social, economical, and technology trends that then shape our own technology strategy and our product and portfolio strategy. So once we've gone through those uh, almost 150 plus uh, trends analysis, um, one of the things that has come out very clearly is that the need for high performance will remain very critical and very relevant. We will also need a lot of flexibility in how we build and design these networks, architect these networks. But we will also need the flexibility in our products and solutions so that our customers can uh, develop that flexibility in their designs. So as we go from the very mature business as usual demand that we, we have a lot of certainty about to very uncertain world where we have less clarity on exactly when and in what shape it will happen. We're trying to work on this principle of future ready performance. So whenever that happens, we will be ready to deal with that demand. And the way we are doing that is we are building that flexibility in all our portfolio uh, across Nokia. So whether it's in the radio access networks, once you've invested in the initial nodes, we can add additional capacity, higher performance as new technology comes along but your original investment remains secure. When we look at the IP and optical networks, it's exactly the same thing. When, when the customers need to go to 800 gig or even beyond that, whatever they're investing with us in today, that investment will be secure because we'll be able to plug those new technologies and capabilities as line cards into these products. When we look at our fiber access technologies, we are already giving our customers the flexibility to go from one gig to 25 gig whenever they need it whenever their customers require them. So 
What you will see there during this decade is that that will start to become a theme that if you're not sure exactly when that demand, exactly when that stringent requirement will come in, but what you will be sure about is that there is a capability and the flexibility that's coming into these networks that will help you meet that demand. Now, one of the benefits of this flexible approach will be, of course, the return on investment assurance that we're talking about. You will be able to avoid stranded investments. So you don't want to invest too early when the demand comes in a little bit later. But you also don't want to be in a situation when that demand comes in, you are taking two years to upgrade the infrastructure to meet that. And so you're in the catch up mode. So we're trying to help our customers get it right at the right time in, in, a, in a cost optimized manner, deliver the right performance in the right place with the right capability set, whether it's in radio, fixed access, IP optical or anywhere else in the networks. This mantra around delivering the high performance with the right flexibility will remain during this decade. Now, when we talk about the higher performance, whether it's in the form of going from the throughput that we have today in our networks, wireless, fixed access, IP optical, to where we will end up by the end of this decade, where we're looking at roughly 100 gig uh, type access technologies that are going to emerge by then. So when you look at the performance from going from today's networks to that 100 gig uh, capability, how will we do that? The way we will deliver that is through the control on things like the silicon design, making sure that we can push more bits through the spectrum that we have available in any kind of networks. So silicon design and the control over that has become super important for a company like Nokia because of our presence in almost all the network domains. And so by controlling that design, by driving that maximum efficiency in that silicon, by having the right reliable software then working with that silicon, we will be able to push the performance out to the maximum. So the combination of those flexibility that we're building into the products in the architectures and designs and the mastery over the silicon through this decade are the two things in particular that will come together uh, to deliver the performance and the demand of the future. Uh, and of course, one of the other requirements that has come to fore quite dramatically in the last couple of years in particular uh, around sustainability, well, how do we reduce the power consumption of these networks? Well, part of that would be eradicating some of the legacy technologies, which consume just way too much uh, energy. But the other part of the equation will be that these exact silicon system on designs that we're creating, they will help reduce the, silicon, the power consumption. In some cases already with the FP5 chips that we have in the IP or a PSE6 and the uh, optical, we are seeing something like 70% or 75% power consumption reduction. In other domains, we're seeing 20, 30, 40% power consumption reduction with each generation. So when you pull that whole process and the capability together, you not only get to meet the future demand, nor, no matter how uncertain it is and when it happens, but you also continue to create the capability, a platform on which you will be able to deliver the performance when you need it, and you will do so by meeting the other requirements around the sustainability on the energy consumption reduction. So all three things come together to be able to deliver the, uh, the performance for the right profitability for our customers. Now, it's not just the networks that are changing, our operations also need to evolve. Um, what does the path to autonomous networking look like? I think the Automation in the networks and the operation is nothing new. We've been doing that for the last 40 odd years. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that aspect. We, we know what the typical challenges are, manual processes and turning them into digitalized processes and then automating them. The real big shift in this decade in particular is the cognitive automation. And this is where we, where we are using AI ML models inside the solutions. Um, now, interesting thing is that you know, three years ago, the thesis would have been that, yeah, we need to build new software oriented solutions um, that will deliver these automations in the operations environment. So there are a lot of work that is still being done manually or is repetitive in nature. We can continue to optimize and automate that. What has happened now is that once we've also realized that the high performance is not just going to be delivered in the software layer, the hardware still needs to be super critical in that delivery of the performance. So the way we are going to do that is using those system on chips that we talked about earlier. 
And as we do that, we are putting the intelligence in those very high performance hardware solutions inside the system on chip that we're creating on the silicon. So we are distributing the intelligence from the centralized cloud-based software solutions all the way to radio solutions, IP routers, optical switches, and so on and so forth. So that combination of the distributed intelligence and the centralized intelligence using the trained AI models or self-learning AI models, all of that starts to come together to give the operators, our customers, the ability to automate a lot more, deal with the complexity that is coming in terms of the new technologies and the evolution of the current networks, and start to simplify that using the intent-based automation that the industry is uh, adopting right now. So it's a long journey, but as you can see, some of the things that were relevant or clear three years ago, they have changed, some assumptions have changed. But we are adjusting according to uh, the market needs, and we are delivering and creating products and solutions that will enable automation, yes, in the centralized manner, but also embedded in the distributions, distributed solutions. Together, they will help us get to that vision of autonomous networks where a lot of manual intervention will be taken away, where faults will be identified before they even happen. So the predictive maintenance will start to kick in, where the service degradation will be predicted before it happens so that the customers are not dissatisfied at all. So this is how, using the cognitive automation, we will be able to deliver the vision of those autonomous networks going forward. Now, one of the things that hasn't changed is the ongoing suggestion that telecom networks might just become dumb pipes. Uh, what kind of future do you see for the telecom sector? I think this is the debate that's gone on for roughly 10 years now, that are we really becoming a dumb pipe industry and everybody else comes on top and takes the value away. I think coming out of pandemic, what we really saw was that the value of these networks became really clear uh, to the consumers, to the professionals, to the enterprises, uh, to the industries. Um, what we are seeing is this uh, battle for the home office, for example, happening right, right around the world where people, when they're working from home in hybrid environment, they need higher performance, they need more reliability. So that notion that we had that these are dumb pipes is kind of starting to go away because people have started to realize that these are very valuable infrastructures that we're uh, utilizing to stay employed, to deliver productivity for our businesses and so on. So that kind of part of the decade and for the, of the debate is over. The other part where how do we create more value is kind of what we discussed a little bit earlier on, where, yeah, we need to deliver new value to the industrial customers, to the other enterprises which are digital in nature. They still need some help. So when we look at the upside of the opportunities on top of what we're already delivering today, it shows us that not only will our infrastructure, our networks remain extremely relevant and valuable for this wider society and the economy as it stands today, it will go up a few levels when we start to help industries further digitalize and they create more value through their, through their productivity and safety enhancements in their sectors. So uh, in my view, we are absolutely on the right track, being recognized for the value we deliver already coming out of pandemic, and we have a lot of upside in creating more value for CSPs, for the enterprises, for the industries, for the governments, for the society as a whole. So in my mind, absolutely no doubt, the future for our industry is very bright. We just need to continue to make sure that we price and value our services the right way uh, so that the health of the overall economy continues to improve during this decade. Well, I think you're right. The, the recognition is there from the, the, the rest of the world about what the communications industry does. And it's great to hear a positive outlook on the sector. So, Asfar, thanks very much for your insights and for joining us today. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ray.